So this is part of chapter um, 8 and 9, 9.38, this is the sex. So we learned about Marco Tane, and we're going to come back and do more theory of Marco Tane, which is really cool. But right now we're going to take a little uh, detour and do hidden Markov models, which is more of an application of Markov chain. Okay. So, um, so let me switch over to the document camera. And let's go this working. There's a signal. Oh, there it is. Okay, hidden Markov model. So, um, yeah. Uh, so the idea is. Um, that is this figure, I guess I could redraw this figure, but I'm going to just zoom into it. Um, and the idea is that you have a sequence of states here, and then for each state, there's some observation, and the conditional distribution of the observation given the state is, uh, is the, 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 the parameterized a parametric model, and in, in, in this case we'll be mostly considering it to be conditionally Gaussian. And then for each, for each um, state, there's a different mean and, and variance of the Gaussian. It could be other distributions. Um, it could be like conditionally Poisson or conditionally Gamma or whatever. It's actually, it looks like that as long as it's an exponential distribution, it uh, pretty much works out um, in closed form. And even if it isn't an exponential distribution, it would work out in unclosed form. Okay, so um, uh, so okay, so these states there's a discrete and typically finite number of states. So there's some kind of distribution, and the distribution, uh, the distribution of, of this of the observation of y is going to be a function of the state x. So there's going to be, uh, I write f of y k, that's the conditional uh, density of y given k. And k is the, the, the uh, uh, class of the state. So here is the distribution of the And this might be a multidimensional observation y2. We'll do that case also. But uh, we'll start off with the scale of k. And uh, then the parameters of the distribution are um, the probability of the initial state and the probability of the transition, Pij, through the Markov chain. So there's the parameters of the Markov chain uh, uh, for x, okay? And um, so uh, then, uh, so then the joint distribution um, y and x can be written as this form. So it's kind of good to go through here. So, um, so each, um, so uh, the, the observations are conditionally independent given the state. So, it, so the conditional distribution of the observations given the state is a product of conditional distributions of each individual state uh, uh, if individual observation given its corresponding state. So you take a product of these x, so f of y n, x n, the product of the f is going to be the um, conditional distribution of the sequence of observations given the sequence of state. And then if you multiply each f by its corresponding um, probability of Xn given Xn minus 1, that's sort of the combination of, that's basically, this is the conditional distribution of Y given Xn minus 1. Actually, it's the conditional distribution of Y and Xn given Xn minus 1. So you multiply those all together and you multiply by the probability of the initial state, you get the joint distribution of Y and X together. I mean, you can work through this. Uh, I think it's a um, homework problem or something, but it's true. You know, after a while, you kind of get used to it. Basically, uh, when you draw this kind of a diagram, the arrow represents conditional distribution, and for every arrow in the diagram, you're going to have a term associated with that probability of that transition. And you multiply basically all these edges together, the terms associated with each of the edges together in the graph, 
together with the probability of the initial state, and that's going to be the joint probability of the whole thing. That's going to be true whenever you have an acyclic graph. So this is a, a DAG, a diagonal, uh, a, a, a directed acyclic graph, right? A DAG. So you may have learned about this before. So it, it, this is in particular a tree. It may not look like a tree, but it's a tree, right? If I pick it up by the node x0, I always like to say, if you pick it up and you sort of shake it, okay? And like if this was a piece of, if I cut this down, it was like a, a bracelet, okay? With, with, and each of these was like a little charm on the bracelet, and these were the little things connecting. And I picked the bracelet up by here, and I shook it. It would hang down like a tree, right? In fact, if I pick it up by any node, it's a tree with just a different root. But if, in particular, if I pick it up by x0, it's a tree, and x0 is a root. So whenever you have a, a, a directed, and so and when you have a tree like this, you can always just take the props of the probabilities of all the transitions, and it's going to be the, uh, uh, the probability of the entire sequence. So that's where this comes from. And then um, if you take the log of that product terms into a sum, you get an expression like this. Okay, so, um, okay, so that's the joint distribution of the hidden Markov model. But it, typically what happens is that you observe y that x is unknown. So this could be like speech. And in speech, these would be the observations you had at each time. And then x would be the unknown state. Typically what the unknown state is is so-called phonies. Okay, so, um, their phonemes are the little the sounds that you learn when you're a kid when you're trying to spell in English, right? So A, A, uh, D, B. You know, the, the, each letter is usually associated with one or more phonemes, right? You know, for the vowels, we have the long and the short phonemes. So, so there's so many different phonemes in English, and other languages have a different number of phonemes. Sometimes it's a subset, and sometimes it's a superset. So. You know, other languages can have phonemes that English doesn't have. Like, for instance, uh, the rolled R in a lot of languages doesn't even exist in English. So, you know, English speakers, when they try to speak in other languages, it sounds funny when they have the rolled R because they don't spell it correctly, right? Because it's a phoneme we don't have. But anyway, there's still phonemes in any given language, and these states could represent the different phonemes being voiced. So you don't directly observe that. You have to infer it from the signal. Okay, so that's how this works. And this turns out to be useful, a useful model for speech. Up until recently, you know, hand Markov models were used in most speech applications, but now there's some other techniques that are becoming popular. But still, I think speech, uh, hand Markov model, I'm not an expert in speech, but uh, are widely used still in speech applications. Um, but in any case, um, uh, so, okay, so this is the model, and there's three things that you might want to do uh, with the Markov model. One is, you might want to estimate the state, okay, so from the observation. Another is that you might want to train the model, so you might want to say, okay, I'm going to have some data, and I want to estimate what the probabilities of the transitions are between these states, and the, prob and the, and the means and variances associated with each class. Uh, from the data. Now, that's sort of tricky because you don't observe the x's directly. You only observe the y's. So how are you going to learn about the probabilities of the transition? Well, at first, you were going to use the EM algorithm because it's an incomplete estimation problem. So you might want to do state estimation. You might want to do um, estimation of the parameters. That's the EM algorithm. In this, in this, in this application, it's often called the Baum Walsh algorithm. Actually, Baum, and Walsh, Baum was the first person to really discover the EM algorithm, but then it you know, often doesn't get cited as a source reference, even though he was. Okay, and um, then um, and then the other thing you might want to do is okay. Now you might have a, a series of different hidden Markov models. So the difference between different hidden Markov models is just different sets of parameters, and the parameters of the model are the, pro are the probabilities of the different transitions. So, for a particular, so you might have one hidden Markov model for the word yes, and another hidden Markov model for the word no, right? So it's a different sequence of phonemes. 
And then if you want to try to figure out whether the person said yes or no, you get the hidden Markov model to the data and you see which hidden Markov model fits best. So that's calculating the likelihood associated with, right, this is a probability distribution. So you have two probability distributions. The maximum likelihood classifier would be the one. You calculate the likelihood of the observed data given two models, and you pick the one that creates the greatest likelihood. And remember, the likelihood is the probability density uh, evaluated for the random sequence. Uh, you, you remember what the likelihood is. The definition of the likelihood. Likelihoods are not probabilities, right? Because uh, a likelihood, the likelihood of some parameter theta is defined as the log likelihood would be the log of the probability of the observation of log given theta. So it's not a probability distribution of theta. It's the evaluation of the probability for that parameter. And then maximum likelihood, so you have, you might have uh, you know, two different parameters, theta 1 and you might have theta 0. Could be theta 1 or theta 0, right? And the maximum, the maximum likelihood classifier would be, uh, what it would do is if, if L of theta 1 is greater than L of theta 0, then the classification is theta 1. And if L of theta 1 is less than or say equal to L of theta 0, the classification is theta uh, 0. All right. So that's the maximum likelihood estimator for the classifier. Maximum likelihood classifier. So there's three, there's three things you might want to do. You might want to estimate the state. You might want to uh, uh, you might want to um, uh, estimate the parameters of the model, some training, training data, and you might want to calculate the probability of the sequence. So uh, I cast, so there's three sections here: state estimation, and then there's state probability. Uh, uh, this is calculating the state probability, and then you use the calculation of the state probability to estimate the parameters, and that's the training HMS. So this is estimating the parameters. So the three sections correspond to the three things you want to do. Estimate the probability, estimate the state, and train it. Okay. Now it turns out you need to estimate the probabilities to train it. And the reason is, if you're going to use the EM algorithm, you have to be able to basically calculate the probability distribution of X given Y and Z, right? You need that for EM algorithm because you have this hidden state and you have to calculate the probability distribution of the state, and then you use that iteratively to uh, estimate the parameters, right? Okay, is everybody clear on this? Now, um, let's see. Okay, so let's do state sequence estimation first. And I'm going to kind of go through this fast, so you need to read these notes, okay? But, um, so in the state sequence estimation, what you want to do is you want to maximize x with respect to y and theta. Okay. So uh, you want to find that. Well, I mean, it's not the only way to estimate the state, but it's a way. It's the, what's called the max. It's the mass estimate of the state. <coughs> so, well, you know, it's easy enough to show. You should know this by now that maximizing the, the map estimate can be computed as just by maximizing the probability of the joint distribution of, of the joint probability of y and x, where y and x is the sequence. So I can just write down the expression. So this is what I want to maximize. Equation 9.5. I want to find the x, the sequence x, which maximizes this expression. Now, just kind of looking at this naively, it looks quite difficult because say, well, all these terms are coupled. So if I take any particular value of x at one time, uh, I can maximize with respect to that one time, but then uh, the other x's aren't necessarily maximized. So I could do coordinate descent like we had. I could, for each, for each state at each time, I could maximize 
the probability, the overall sequence. And I, uh, you know, the same thing as we had before, it would be an iterative algorithm. It wouldn't necessarily converge to the global minimum, in fact, uh, because this is not a convex optimization problem. It can't be convex because it's discrete. Convexity isn't even defined for discrete function. So, um, it won't necessarily globally converge. It'll locally converge, and it'll converge in a finite number of steps because it'll, you get a minus ton of decreasing sequence. But you won't necessarily get a global minimum. So how do you solve this to function to get a global minimum? Well, you can use what's called dynamic programming. Okay? How many people are familiar with dynamic programming? Okay, dynamic programming is a clever kind of algorithm. It's like uh, dynamic programming is extremely useful when you're pl planning a project. Okay? So if you have oh, 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 I'll wait. Uh, okay. So if you're if you're planning a plot project, so you know, if someone says, Okay, we have to, you know, finish designing the F sixteen by the end of May. You go, Okay, well, okay, so we're gonna have to be end done in, in May, okay? So that means that by the end of December, we have to have the airframe completed, okay? So you kind of work backwards, right? And you say, and that means we have to have all the avionics designed by um, the end of uh, November, okay? It's a pretty tight deadline, okay? So, um, so, yeah, so you work backwards. You know where you have to be, right? So you say, okay, I have to be in San Francisco on the evening of December 2nd. Okay, so what I'll do is I say, well, the flight now to get there, I have to leave on uh, you know, December uh, uh, on the morning of December first in order to get there on time, right? Which means I have to be, you know, and you work backwards. So that's what the dynamic programming purpose is. You work backwards. Okay, so um, so uh, okay, so here, uh, so the way you do it is like this. Say, okay, well, first of all, you have this concept of the future. Oh, okay, well, okay. What you do is, you, okay. So you have the concept of the future, the present, and the past. And you, you can write out distribution. So, um, the future, I'm gonna, I have this notation here which I'll write y subscript greater n means all the values of y that occur after time n, where n is the present. Okay. And um, so, uh, so then uh, the joint distribution of, of y and x is the uh, conditional distribution of all the future values of x and y given the present value of x. And then you also multiply by the present uh, probability of y given the present state of x. And then you multiply by the joint distribution of all the past states of y and x and the present state of x. So if you multiply this together, you should convince yourself in equation 9.6 that the joint distribution can be decomposed into the product of these three components, right? Then, um, so, uh, so then what you do is you say, okay, well, you basically set up, okay, you define this expression, which is L, L here is the law of likelihood uh, associated with all, uh, with, the, with the probability, the, the law of probability of the future um, of the sequence, given the assumption that at time n, you start in the state xn. So, uh, so L of xn, n, this is a, a discrete function of the state at time n, and n. So you have to know what n you're talking about. So for every time n, this tells you what the probability is of the most likely sequence uh, of state starting at time n uh, and, and continuing on, okay? so. This function here, L sub xn n, like, well, we don't know it. If we knew it, we'd be finished. But we're going to find a recursion that we can use to compute this thing. If we knew this L sub xn n for time zero, what we would then do is just pick 
the most likely thing and that, 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 that uh, maximizes this L, and we'd be done. Right? But the problem is, how would you know it? So you can set up a recursion, and this is the recursion, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, on equation 9.7, because I'm going to let you just think about it. I mean, and you really just need to read this section and convince yourself that it all makes sense. But um, it, you basically, the, the uh, long likelihood of the sequence starting at time n minus 1 in state i, right, is equal to the um, long likelihood of the sequence starting in state j at time n times the probability of the, of the transition from i to j times the probability of the observation at time j. So if you just kind of stare at this equation, 9.7, long enough, I think it will eventually make sense to you. That if you knew the best possible long likelihood you could achieve at uh, going from time n to the n, then the best you could achieve at time n minus 1 to the n would be this sequence minimized over j, because j is the, is the state at time, uh, at, at, at time n. All right. So you're assuming that time n minus 1 is i, and then you can have the degree of freedom to pick j to be whatever you want, and you just maximize over that. Well, now this is a recursion. So you could just start the recursion. Um, you can start the recursion at time, uh, let me see, the way you initialize it, I have it here. Um, Okay, so at the at time upper, but the last time that you start the recursion is with a log likelihood being zero, which that corresponds to a probability of one. If you think about it, I mean, one of that eventually makes sense. And then you just apply this recursion going backwards in time until you get to time zero, and you calculate each of these L I N. So this, in terms of computer memory. The way this works is this. You have this, uh, this axis is time, so it's n. And you start at time 0 and you end at time n, right? So you have uh, basically a memory position for each value of n. Okay? And then so this axis here is going to be state. So you have um, state 0, and then the last state is n minus 1. And I'm not really having to draw a lot, so I'll only put four states. Now. represents a memory location in the computer. You start off by initializing these are all going to be zeros at the last hand, right? And then for each, and then you work backwards in time. So to compute time n minus 1, you, you apply this recursion here in equation 9.7. And um, basically, you add this term associated with uh, I j to uh, to to uh, L sub j n. So you can think of, they call this a trellis. So for each of these states, there's some transition cost for going each state here. And what you do is you pick, for each of these, you pick the, the path that minimizes the cost to the next value, right? So you only, for each of these, you're only going to have one that, that the rest of them all get pruned. So you, and you work all the way backwards until you get to time zero. So the complexity of the algorithm is going to be 
uh, well, let's figure it out. It's going to be proportional to n, because you're going to have to do this for each point in time, right? So the complexity, the number of operations, is going to be, it's going to be n times something, right? Now, what you have to do is that for each state here, you have to check every place you may have come from and find the minimum of all the places you might have come from, right? So that's going to require that you multiply by, so for each state, you're going to have n possibilities you're going to have to check. But you're going to have to do that for each state here. So you're going to have to do that for each state so it's times n. So the total computational complexity is going to be n times m, m squared. Okay. So it's linear in time, but it's quadratic in the number of states. Mm -hmm. Question? Uh, can you explain the m square of stuff again? Like, uh, yeah. So you you have so for each state here, to minimize the expression at 9.7, you're going to have to minimize over j. Okay. So for each state, you'll minimize over j, and there's there's m values of j, so that'll take m operations per state. But now you have to do that for every one of these states. And there's n of those. So you're going to have n squared. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. And you're going to have to do that for every time, so it's going to be n times n squared. And that's the complexity of the algorithm. Yeah. Um, if you had a greedy algorithm instead, would you have n times n? Uh, yeah. Right. Because if you just did updates at every time, right. it's a good point. If you did updates at every time, you only have, for that update, you only have to check the n possible states of that, that thing, right? So the complexity of the greedy algorithm is lower, at least per iteration, than the complexity of the optimal algorithm. But, but um, right, so, so but you, for a lot of applications, if you can do the dynamic programming, people like it, because you get the exact solution and the iterative thing. You know, people tend to feel like, well, well, you know, error things, you do them if you have to. But it's sort of painful because you, you know, there's convergence issues, there's a lot of issues, right? And here you know you get the optimum solution. So for instance, the same algorithm is used in decoding and modem. This is called the Viterbi algorithm in, in uh, communications, right? And, and you know, they, they, they typically do this exactly because they want the, the signal noise. And, the computation isn't that expensive. But if the number of states gets really moved behind, then it could be very difficult. So the complexity is n squared But computers are fast, so. Um, okay. So now, actually, uh, you sort of feel like you should be done when you get all the way to the end, but you're really not. Because when you it really, once you get all the way to the end, all you know is you know which initial state is the correct state to get the optimum path. But you don't actually know the path. So to get the path, you have to go back forward again and read it out, sort of. So that's this recursion here, 8.8 .8 and 9.8 and 9.9. So you basically go forward then in time. Um, uh, once you know, once you've calculated, see, because this recursion 9.7, you calculate the, the function lin, right? And then once you know lin, then you can um, uh, actually read out the result by plugging lin in here and, um, and into 9.9 .9 and then finding the value uh, which maximizes this expression at each at each uh, in See, because here you just 9.7 doesn't give you the answer, it just gives you a function, right? This L function. Once you have this L function, you plug it in 9.9, and then you can actually estimate the, the you can calculate the maximum life, the, the math state. So this is exact, it gives you the exact answer. There are some issues in practice, like you have to store all this and then go back again. Like if it's a streaming application, like a continue, like speech or communication, then you would have to go all the way to infinity. So then that would be a, like a problem. You'd have to buffer an infinite amount of data. So in practice, for real communication problems, they have to truncate this at some point. And there's lots of techniques to do this for doing that. 
you could block, you could chunk up the data into long sequences. And what your hope is is that you run the sequence long enough, eventually what happens in the middle doesn't depend on what happens in the end. Okay? Uh, but you know, that's not so much of a problem for imaging applications, because images tend to be finite, right? They're not streaming. Uh, they could be streaming in time, but they're not streaming in space. Uh, one yeah. question that I have, uh, can you show that space? Mm -hmm. okay. So this X kappa zero can be used to like, estimate the state of uh, all the n uh, variables? Yes, so every state you get, you get a sequence of states, yeah. which are optimal in the sense of the minimum, there's a map as to this, and maximize the posterior probability. Yeah. Right. And uh, X kappa, oh, I'm sorry, say that again? Did you understand that, or did that make clear? Uh, the last, the last one. I mean, how is x gap zero used to estimate x cap sign here? Uh, oh, because uh, I'm sorry. How's x cap zero used to do x cap one? Uh, yeah, for uh, to use to estimate the x, x cap n, like any. Yeah, yeah. Because what happens? See, now this is see x in nine point nine. X. This has a very good question. X cap of n minus one is in at nine point nine. So you have to iterate this forward in time, because you need the previous answer. Okay, so what ends up happening is then you go forward in time. So you find, first you find the optimal value of x zero, which whatever it is. So yeah. I'll put a square around this value. Yeah. Okay? Once you find the optimal value of that, then you can find the optimal value of the next one, which oh. might be here, because you can actually explicitly compute that. Because you actually need to know what the optimal value was at times n minus 1 in order to calculate the optimal value at times n. See, it actually appears in 9.9. You see what I mean? Yeah. Is that clear? It's a very, very, very good question. Excellent question. Okay. Any other questions on that? So, uh, okay, so, so that state sequence estimation. Nine, um, getting out of sequence. That's the state sequence. Now, the next thing is very closely related. It's the state probability. So this tells you the maximum probability. The, the, this tells you the state sequence that has maximum probability. But it doesn't tell you the probability of the state. Like, I might want to know what's the probability that the third state is equal to uh, one, okay? I might want to calculate that probability. I'm not going to need that for training. Right? I might also want to calculate the probability that the third state is equal to one and the fourth state is equal to two, okay? So I might want joint probability to pair the states. Can I calculate them? Well, in general, no. But in the particular case of the hidden Marco model, yes. It turns out there's a recursion very similar to the dynamic programming room recursion. But it will calculate the probability of all these state sequences. Exactly. Exactly. It's beautiful. Okay. So it only works in 1D. If you go to 2D, we'll talk about it later, it doesn't work. But it works in 1D. And uh, the algorithm is called the forward backward algorithm. Okay? And you know why it's called the forward backward algorithm? Because first it goes forward. And then it goes backwards. Actually, that's a lot. First it goes backwards, and then it goes forward. It's very much like the dynamic programming, because you see we had a first we the backwards thing, we calculate these, these optimal paths, and then we, we went forward to sort of read it out. Same kind of idea. So to do this, we're going to read this section carefully, and for a few reasons. But one of them is because it'll make me feel better, because I spent so much time writing it. I have to tell somebody read it, okay? So, well, okay, so, because I try to make it clear. If it's not clear, please tell me, because I try, like to try to make it better. But, but you have to define this alpha and this beta. And I'm going to try to explain it, but this, it's not possible for me to teach this there. You have to go read it, okay? I think it can give you the general feeling, okay? But I can't really explain it to you because it's not the right way to do it. You need to just study it at home. And then, uh, please do not attempt this. In, well, on your own. Mm -hmm. Now, please attempt this on your own, okay? So, alpha here, alpha sub n of j, okay, what is it? It's defined as the probability, the joint probability of the past of y and the present of y 
and the current state x being equal to j. Okay. Now the y's are given because they're just functions of the data. So I suppress the dependencies here. It there's no point in making an explicit function of y. It's for a particular observation, a particular realization of the sequence. Okay. So going back to these pictures, um, basically the alpha is the joint probability of some particular state xn and all the associated uh, 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 and all the associated previous uh, observations. But it does, it marginalizes out the x's. So it's just the probability of all the observations up to time n given that x is equal to some particular state. And that state is j. So xn j, alpha sub n of j is the probability of all the past observations given that the state is takes on value j at time n. Is that clear? And then the beta here is the probability of all the future observations given that uh, at time n the state is j. Okay? So, okay, good. Now, if I multiply alpha and beta together, then if I multiply alpha and beta together, I just get the joint probability that um, x n, the state of time n is on is, is state j, takes on state j, and all the observations. So now this becomes just the joint probability of the state of time n and all the observations. From this, I can calculate the conditional probability that x has state j x and have state j and all the y's by just normalizing it. So to normalize is easy. I just sum over j and divide. So, so, this, so if I can calculate alpha and beta, then I can calculate the marginal probability of any state given all the observations. All right. That's very useful because that actually you know, is an interesting question. If I'm trying to estimate the state, um, if I'm trying to estimate the state, um, I, I told you how to find the math sequence estimate. But what's better, the math estimate of the sequences or the value of the probability of that state, or the, I'm sorry, or the value of that state that maximizes the probability given all the observations? Those are two different things. One is the marginal probability of xn, given all the observations, and the other is the max probability of the whole sequence. One is maximizing the sequence probability, the other one is maximizing the marginal probability of a single observation of the state, of a single state. Okay? Which one's better? Why? Uh, okay, so the answer is, Okay, so your answer is basically right, by the way, okay? Okay, but, but I'm going to split hair, okay? So the, the, the hair I'm going to split is I'm going to say, well, neither is better because it, it depends on what your criteria is, okay? If your uh, criteria is that you want the maximum probability of the state to be one, well, then the math is the best. But the probability is that you want a maximum, minimize the probability of error of any individual state, then the second thing is that. Usually the second thing is the thing that can be best, because usually the probability of error of each individual state is, is the relevant thing. If you're trying to minimize the probability of error in decoding of a sequence, like for a communications problem, then the second thing would be better, okay? But, uh, but you then could get a, a result in terms of the overall sequence of states that has a probability where the state sequence has a probability of zero, okay? In other words, it could be you could read out a state sequence which can't occur. Okay? Here, let me give you an example. So let's say you're doing segmentation of an image, right? And you have, so this is your image, okay? And there's some kind of region here, okay? And the region in here is, is 1, and the region on the outside is 0, okay? And let's say you know, someone tells you that, um, that the boundary here, uh, this has to be a connected component, okay? 
but there could be like, I don't know, some kind of weird situation that the max, the, uh, for, if you classify each pixel individually to, to maximize the probability of that class of that individual pixel, then you might actually get a result where, where you have like an edge is like jittery and you get a one here and then a zero and then a one. Okay? That might be the minimum probability of error classification. But in fact, the actual segmentation you got has a probability of zero of occurring, or maybe very improbable for another probability, okay? So, um, so, you, so you have to make a distinction. In one case, you're asking for the overall scenario that has the most probability. In the other case, you're asking for each individual pixel that has the most, that has the highest probability class. But, you know, but the overall scenario then might could be inconsistent, right? Does that make sense? At least vaguely from a gestalt point of view. If you maximize the probability of a state, one state, doesn't that maximize the probability of the sequence automatically? No. Because you can have um, no, it doesn't. It, it, well, I mean, you know, one it's like one of those things that's hard to explain because, well, you know, how do you explain it? Because the only thing I can do is I can say, well, I'd have to find a counterexample is one way of explaining it. But believe me, such counterexamples exist. But the, the solutions are just different, right? But uh, intuitively, um, your, your criteria, one is the map criteria, and the other one is, I think we did, I called it the NPM criteria, or we're going to do it later, the maximizer of the posterior marginal. Okay? So this is, but the important thing at this point is just to realize they're different. Okay. And that with you can calculate the maximizer of the criteria marginals by knowing these alpha and betas. But the dynamic programming problem gives you the map of Now so now in addition you can calculate the probability of pairs of states. It's the pairs of states given all the observations. In in equation nine point thirteen, it's sort of a similar kind of thing. Okay? So what I Intimidating you into believing, hopefully, and once you read these notes, you'll agree or is correct, assuming there's no error in my that, that, uh, that once you know the alpha and the beta, you can calculate the probability of any state or any pair of states given the data, okay? Now, um, then the question is, well, how do you calculate the alpha and the beta? Well, it turns out the recursion to that. And the recursion is based upon sort of looking at this picture of figure 9.3. Uh, basically, you just kind of work backwards. Um, you know, I, I can go through this. I think it's, it's very similar to the dynamic programming thing. <laughs> you have a forward recursion and a backward recursion. Calculating the alpha is a forward recursion, and calculating the beta is a backward recursion. So let's say the beta. To calculate the, the, the beta at time n, you take all the betas at time n plus 1, and you multiply it by the additional probability of the transition and the observation probability, and then you sum over the extra state. I'm not even going to go into it, because you know what? It is what it is. You have to read this carefully and believe it, okay? And convince yourself it's true. Now, the thing that's interesting here is that, oh, one of the things to keep in mind is, if you actually implement this algorithm in this way, it won't work. <laughs> Why? Because uh, these probabilities are the probabilities of the entire sequence. If it's a long sequence, the probability of the sequence can be extraordinarily small. So you can underflow the float in your computer because basically um, it's like a an exponentiation. So you're really using the exponent. And the exponent doesn't have that much precision. Even in a double precision flow, you have like uh, plus or minus 300 or something like that. I'm saying. Yeah, 300 is not a big number. It doesn't have that much dynamic rate. You'll eventually overflow it if you work on a large sequence. So for real algorithms, usually what you do, there's lots of various tricks to making it efficient. But you really work not with the alpha, but with the log of alpha. Okay. 
I just want to give that as a warning. So if you ever implement this, it will not work if you implement it this way. You have to actually take a log of everything, or you'll have horrible green green problems, and the program will just not work. So underflow, and you'll get all kinds of man. Okay? And unless your sequences are very short. Okay. But but in concept it works. Okay. Now um uh, okay. Um now, okay, now the last thing is training of HMNs and the mean algorithm. Now we learned the magic trick of the exponential distribution. And you basically, uh, okay, I'm going to go through this fast. You have to uh, uh, take my word for it, or go through here and read this very carefully and show yourself that the, that the, um, um, the, 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 the current combination of y and x together, y and x is an exponential distribution. And the natural sufficient statistics for that exponential distribution are given by equations 9.16 through 9.19. There, you basically count the number of times each, uh, each. Okay, so the bj here is the, the expected is is the sum of the y's associated with each class. The s is the, is the sample covariance associated with the these classes. This is for the vector case. Okay. Uh, the n uh, counts the number of times that the first thing is equal to state j, and the kij is a histogram of the uh, of the pairs of states because you need pairs now because it's a Markov chain. So these are the sufficient statistics for the complete data. If you know these things, you can actually write down the uh, maximum likely estimate of the parameters, and that's on, on page 195. So, you know, it's pretty much what you would expect. Mu is bj or k, you know, it, it makes sense, okay? Just go through it and you'll see. But this is so you know x and y. You can observe it. If you can y, observe x and y, it's easy enough. You just calculate the, the, prop, the rate of transition in the markup chain. You calculate the expected mean and covariance for, the, um, for each of the classes, okay? But you don't know x. So how do you do this? Well, this is the magic trick. You just take the expectation of the natural sufficient statistics. We know that this works from the previous chapter. All that work we did, now we got a gigantic sledgehammer, and we can solve the problem really easily. We can, on the bottom of page 195, we take the conditional, we take the expectations, the conditional expectations of the sufficient statistics using the observed um, data. So, so these, these conditional probabilities we calculate with Bayes, these are calculated with the forward backward algorithm now, okay? And then once we use, run the forward backward algorithm, we can calculate the expected values of these sufficient statistics. And once we have the sufficient statistics, we just plug them right back in to the maximum likely estimate as if we knew them and we had directly observed x and y. So this is, you know, it's a beautiful thing because on page 196, what happens is that the EM update, this is the end step, so this is the end step, right? This is the end step. Okay, the end step here is just exactly like the maximum likelihood uh, estimator, except we just put bars. I mean, the entire calculation is just putting a bar over every sufficient statistic. I mean, it's, 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 it's so simple, right? You just do that. And then, of course, to calculate the thing with the bar, we have to take the expectation. Now, to do that, you needed the alpha, you needed the uh, forward backward algorithm. So that's how you calculate these probabilities now. Okay? So, is everybody clear on this? How this works? You, there's a magical convergence of beautiful ideas here, okay? And you first run the forward backward algorithm, that allows you to calculate the marginal probability of each state. With those marginal probabilities, you can now calculate the expected values of each of the sufficient statistics, even though you didn't see x. Because you're calculating the probability of each set x. And then once you have those, those expectations, you just plug them into the maximum likely estimator. You're pretending you knew them, and you plug them in. Okay? And then you just repeat. Because remember, once you have these parameters, and you're, you're, yeah, you'll rerun this forward backward. So you iterate with the forward backward algorithm. You iterate with the forward backward algorithm. This is not turning off. Yeah. Okay. Come on. 
Why is not okay? Okay. Here we go. You iterate with the forward backward algorithm, and then you uh, re-estimate the parameters you repeat, and that's the hidden Markov model. That's the Baumol algorithm. Okay. That's the EM algorithm for hidden Markov.